Hey there, and welcome to Can I Just Say Podcast. This is the second in our series of panels as podcasts from Con of Thrones. This is one I was really looking forward to because I got to be with people who know so much more than me about Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. The panel was called The Common People and the High Lord's Game, and my co-panelists were Michael Monaco from Maester Monthly Podcast, and also two of my favorite people from Watchers on the Wall, Luca Nieto and David Rosenblatt. You can find Watchers on the Wall online, and it is just a website full of smart people writing about Game of Thrones. It's really fun. Uh, Also, Petra Halber from our season eight of Game of Thrones episode is from Watchers on the Wall. All right, enjoy the panel. I did what I did for the good of the realm. The realm? Do you know what the realm is? Oh, it's time. It's time. Oh, hi. Hang on. We're Hello. Time to We've just been talking to each other, but not to you all. <laughs> Which is we'll just keep on. doing that. We'll just, yeah. um, I keep forgetting. I keep calling this the wrong thing, but hopefully I'm getting the name right, and I just am on the wrong page. But I believe this is something like the common folk in the High Lords game. Yep. Uh, I was going to have everyone introduce ourselves first and say what our personal history is with a Game of Thrones slash a Song of Ice and Fire. I'm sorry, what did you do? I am David Rosenblatt. I write for Watchers on the Wall. I was a book reader first before the show existed and then discovered that they were filming a pilot with Sean Bean when I was like in the middle of book two or, or three. It was very exciting. <laughs> I'm Luca. I also write for Watchers on the Wall. I... I had a lot of friends who were into the books. Like an, my ex-girlfriend tried to get me into the books, but I, I never did until the show started, and then I got into both. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael, also known as Bookshelf Stud. I am a moderator on the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit and a host of the Maester Monthly podcast. Um, I got into the books because my high school Latin teacher said, "Do you know? Did you know they were casting Sean Bean as Ned Stark?" And I said, "Who?" <laughs> and <laughs> it went from there. Really? Yeah. Really? Who? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, no who excited. as in Ned Stark? <laughs> like, no, yeah. As in, I didn't know who Ned Stark <laughs> was. Not as in who didn't know who Sean Bean was. Uh, please. Um, <laughs> and and it went from there. I read the books and watched the first season at the same time, and oh. now it's been eight years. <laughs> um, my name is Daphne Olive. I have two podcasts. Um, one is about black sales, which is called Fathoms Deep. The other one is a general podcast about television, books, and film called Can I Just Say, in which we did a li- we have covered Game of Thrones, but don't actually have a Game of Thrones dedicated podcast. Um, I am also um, now a story consultant for the new show that I cannot talk about, sadly, uh, that is being made by the, by the creators of Black Sails. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this awesome topic. I was, I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, I wanted to start by um, talking about the narrative purpose of, of the, I keep wanting to say common folk, but the small folk. Uh, <laughs> I like getting all my terminology mixed up preparing for this. Just call um, them peasants. Peasants, peasants. right? Okay. <laughs> Plebes. Swine. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone use their own terminology. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so purpo- the purpose of common people, like the narrative purpose of these common people who end up in the spheres of the of the lords who are in the game? I feel like these are the people who are accessories to the game. <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. uh, anyone can start. You want to start, David? You want you to go down this way? What is what is their purpose? Um, like narrative purpose. Sure. We're going to talk about their like actual interpersonal ex- relationships too. I th- think. I mean, one of the things that I suppose George is guilty of in creating the world that obviously became the show is that it's largely about uh, high, high lords. I mean, you know, we see everything from <laughs> Tyrion's perspective, and no matter what danger Arya is up to, she's still the daughter of a major, major powerful figure. So I think as the books go on, as the show goes on, as you learn more about the backstories and the intersecting paths of various, whatever we're calling them, uh, small, <laughs> small folk people of less me- lesser means, um, it, it becomes imperative because it's to an extent that's who all these decisions that people on the small council are making, for example, are actually affecting. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, and I think I was mentioning it before the panel that it's interesting that most of the, most of the characters who are from the small folk, <laughs> the small folk, um, are like are only in the show and the books in relation to to the to the nobles to the highborn, like they don't really have their own stories. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Especially like in the in the show, they try to give like for example, for example, Grey Worm and uh, Miss Sunday, they try to gi give their give them like their own personal story. But even then, like you know, th they're servants to a uh, to a queen. It's mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very limited perspective to the highborns. Yeah, I think I think that's generally true. I mean, what the title of the panel, I'm pretty sure, comes from the, you know, why is it that the common folk suffer when the High Lords play their Game of Thrones? Mm -hmm. And I think that generally that's when we get a window on people who aren't, <laughs> people who are peasants, um, is when we need to see the costs of, of war, of power, of all these kind of really horrible things. Um, Brienne's tour of the Riverlands comes to mind, because I think that's when we get, I know she herself is a noble, but that's when we get a lot of the um, interaction with the small folk of Westeros and kind of the like the vox pop man on the street um, to show us the literal feast of the crows that Westeros has been turned into. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel like oh, I was gonna have us do questions at the last ten minutes if that's okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm kind of like mm -hmm. similar, but like I'm s I'm very focused on like the characters who are like who are characters in the story, mm -hmm. and so. I, but I think they serve the same purpose. Like I think, you know, if, if I had to choose one, if I had to choose one thing that I'm gonna say, I mean, Game of Thrones is about so many things. But so if I had to say that Game of Thrones is about one thing, what I would say it is about is power and relationships with power and how we're supposed to feel about power. And I feel like if I was picking a, like an overall narrative purpose that these characters have, the overall narrative purpose for them would be to remind us, um, because we, we we spend a lot of time getting very emotional about lords and getting very emotional about people who have power, seeking power, um, and it's it's so easy in a story to start rooting for those people and forget the costs, and mm -hmm. it's very and so what I, what I like like in addition to when you see kind of generally people who are in pain from this. Mm -hmm. Each one of these lords has someone next to them who also becomes a personal reminder and also a personal reminder for us. Because I think that's really the most important part in, in the narrative is that we, in a story like this that, you know, that subverts a lot of tropes and does do this thing where it's like we don't just have heroes. We have heroes and we have to be reminded that their heroic acts or their fights with each other have costs, and so it's it's a constant reminder for us that we're not supposed to just, you know, cheer for the badassery, but we're also supposed to like remember that these things can be dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, if we want to talk about specific characters in relation to that idea, um, I think Gendry is is a really interesting one, particularly in the show where he he plays more of a role, um, and it, you can't get more like on the nose in terms of metaphors for power and the way that highborns leech power from people than when he is literally strapped to a bed and like leeches are attached to him. <laughs> like like the, the extraction of his yeah. worth for... Yeah, some, some ironically, because they believe he's right, noble born. Right, right, right so. that's true. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, suddenly, yeah. suddenly that scene seems so much more on the nose. Very I'm, very heavy handed, yeah. <laughs> I'm really attempting to bring like a, m a Marxist perspective that's to... Uh, that's, what I, that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> No, but but the, the the way that he as like a lowborn person is expendable in a way that um, Shireen isn't at that time, although she is obviously later for mm -hmm. Stannis, but that he he defaults to well, I've got this lowborn kid, I can just kind of kill him off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you you raise an interesting point though about um, how a lot of the the main characters or who are representative of, of lords or ladies often have a right hand person or people who we follow. And thinking along the lines of Gendry and Shireen, I just think of Davos. Honestly, just mm -hmm. because that's Stannis is you know right right hand person, not just um, hand of the would be king, but <laughs> I, I think a lot of the characters, if you look at it that way, if you look at you know Littlefinger and Varys as adjacent to the crown, there's a lot of um, even uh, if we're thinking way back season one, the first major character to die was Jory, right? Who is who is Ned's right hand you know person? Mm -hmm. like, um, mm -hmm. So it's they, they I think they definitely make a point to show that it's not just the leaders of each household, but it's to an extent for most of the households, there's people or persons associated yeah, with Yeah, you know, them. they're still the servants of the household, so yeah. I think it would be interesting, like, I have a spin-off panel, panel later, so I'm thinking about the prequel, and I think it would be interesting if we get more, like, actual 
small folk stories. Oh man, I would love something yeah. from the POV. Yeah. Of, like, mm -hmm. uh, not in, not in yeah. relation to the high war, not in relation to power, just people living through what apparently will be the long night. Mm -hmm. uh, that right, that, that you yeah. actually go into yeah. like their mm -hmm. actual Sort of like a survival show place. from yeah. the perspective of someone mm -hmm. who is just trying to survive. That, that would be interesting. So, so like <coughs> one of my favorite scenes is I think it's the, the first episode of season seven when Arya is talking to those random Lannister soldiers. Mm. Yes, everyone thinks about Ed Sheeran, but I think it's a better scene for other reasons and it's they're just, it they have casual people. So famous. Honestly, that, that didn't bother me because I, I didn't really know didn't know who that was. was but so. <laughs> like barely. But let's find this close. But <laughs> I liked that they had common people problems. They had everyday problems. He was just like, oh, I think he said like my wife just had a kid or, or right. something like that. I don't I don't remember exactly the lines, but that is that is I think would be a yeah. great idea. Right. They're, they're not evil that no, soldiers. no, they're just people. Right. Yeah. No one <laughs> sends a raven when one of their wives has kids. Yep. No. Yeah. Right. right. And I think, again, that it's, it's narratively interesting to have Arya reminded of that, but really what's happening, again, is it is they all, again, from a structural perspective, they all serve to, to help guide us in the emotional... Yeah, in the emotional road we're supposed to be taking in that all of this. In, in that scene in particular, it, it not only serves the character of Arya, mm -hmm. but also that's episode one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Seven, yeah. yeah, and by episode four we see Daenerys uh, burning a whole lot of uh, Lannister soldiers. Yeah. So it was a way to humanize them and exactly. to have yeah. us realize that they were people, not just you know peons. Right. Exactly. So yeah, I really love that. Okay, so from inside the world, now we're going. We're, we were like outside looking at narrative from the inside the world where we're inside the story, um, which. Which dynamic between between a highborn person and their advisors w is most interesting to you? You know, um, I mean, we don't have to make this most. Just pick one that's fun. Yeah, for you. right. Pick, <laughs> like pick the fun I one. Don't, I don't, I'm not forcing. I'm not going to hold you to it. <laughs> maybe I, I had the Sansa panel like two hours ago, so maybe mm -hmm. it's still in my brain for that reason. But I think Sansa and Shay in the show yeah. have such a really interesting. Um, Dynamic where Shay is very protective of Sansa. Yeah, it was mostly made up, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, entirely mm -hmm. invented because mm -hmm. in the books she was Lawless Stokeworth's uh, or Felice Stokeworth's yeah. handmaid. But that was a good choice, I think, to enhance both really of their characters. It was a very, very, very solid choice. Together. Because yeah. it, you know, Shay knows very well what Sansa's going through and, mm -hmm. and um, feels very protective to, towards her. There's that great scene where um, Sansa has her first period and Shay is really helping her try to like cover it up because yeah. she understands immediately and implicitly like what that means for Sansa and understands because of her own position as someone who has been powerless her whole life. So I think that that dynamic was really interesting. Um, yeah, that one really informs how we're, I think we're supposed to feel about Sansa at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like and it has an interesting power dynamic because Sansa's the one nominally who has power there, but Shay is just knows more yeah. stuff at that point. Mm -hmm. She just is is much more savvy about mm -hmm. how to deal with the world. I think I have a couple, but one actually I just thought of. I kind of like the few scenes that Tyrion and Missandei have together mm -hmm. be yeah. because there's like a lot of unexpected um, perspective that, that is clashing in that he obviously always thinks that he knows everything, but he, he doesn't, right? There's, <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that I think he in many ways learns from her, and I think that was something he definitely didn't expect, and I think it gives her a chance to shine, and it's yeah. a dynamic I don't... It, it, it's not one that's like a major, major horrible thing. No one's walking out of that <laughs> um, as like a terrible power play, so it's nice to have those kinds of scenes, I think, mm. which are pleasant. Yeah, when, when Tyrion is dealing with the slavers, right? Like, yeah. He looks pretty clueless. On, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's one, yeah. yeah. I, was th I was thinking when... when um, when Miss and I interprets that the prophecy can also mean for a woman, right? Not just for a man. And she, she is certainly not a, a high lord or lady, but she does know something. And her perspective is, I think, relevant there because she has a skill set that other people don't. Well, that's that's, that didn't turn out great for Daenerys. But yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's actually... Um, uh, did you guys want to talk about Melisandre at all? Because oh, she's yeah, someone who really comes... <laughs> yeah, she, yes, please. She, sure. she started from nothing, as far as we know, and mm -hmm. then spent hundreds of years getting to the... the like. She says that she was a slave. Yeah. Yeah. So right, right. Even less than than mm -hmm. the small folk, the small yeah. folk of Westeros. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's a, a difficult word for me to say. Actually, like small, small folk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can pick a different word. Yeah. Common. Peasants. Common folk? <laughs> you say small folk peasants, in Spanish. Gonna, we are really just going with peasants. Is there a word for small folk in Spanish? I don't 
I don't. I haven't watched the, the show in Spanish. So I don't <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Melisandre. Yeah, Melisandre is also. I mean, again, it's funny. I now that I'm listening to you all and thinking about it, like I've been very focused on how um, how the small folk uh, advisors to people who are fighting for the throne um, kind of temper them sometimes, but there is actually a really interesting trend also of them just being smarter. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I the, the Varys, the, right. the... Davos and Stannis. Da I mean yeah. Davos right. knows what's up. <laughs> um, so that's really interesting. Like, do we think that this, like, the story... I mean, I guess that relates to one of the other questions I had written down. Like, d are we saying, like, basically they're smarter because they just have wider or more difficult... I mean, again, a lot of the... A lot of the highborn people have really difficult storylines, but but that the these people came from kind of a history of difficult storylines. So is that do we think that they're wiser because of that? Do we think that they're? I think that's part of it, but also you, you know how like in any job like when when there's a woman, she's probably going to be more competent because she's had to mm -hmm. you know fight for it more. Like th I think this is pretty much the Chris same thing. Like right. in in among the highborn, like you basically stumble on mm -hmm. a, on a lot of mm -hmm. jobs like. There are people on the small council, on some of the small councils that are just there because they're there. Like, right. uh, why is Mace Tyrell in the in the <laughs> small council? Giles Rosby. Wis yeah. Wisdom yeah. beyond yeah. his <laughs> years. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mace yeah. Tyrell might be the most hilarious. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's <laughs> great for comic <laughs> relief, but like <laughs> inside the universe, he's like, there because like the competency he, he of his mother. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. So yeah, if if the if the small folk people in this story are uh, appear to be hyper competent. I think right. that makes sense because th they had to get, they there, had to somehow. get there somehow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, right. And Vera, Vera like tells that for story sure. for us. Yeah. Right. There's also, I think, at work. Um, I mean, w we talk a lot about how Song of Ice and Fire relates to like Tolkien and and sort of you know European fantasy, but also I think it's really a really American story, particularly with that kind of like self-made man, mm -hmm. like rising up mm -hmm. type thing, that, like the, the Gatsby myth, as like it the relates. rags to riches right. kind of. Yeah, exactly. The rags yeah. And so. You know, characters like Braun or Varys or um, Davos or even Littlefinger really are characters who are kind of uh, raising themselves up somehow. And that's sometimes through competency, sometimes mm -hmm. through luck, sometimes through like swindling people out of things. But um, that's interesting. So do you think that like, I mean, it would be hard to imagine this not written by an American, but <laughs> had, um, had, let's say, had, had this been written not by an American, but mm. not coming from the perspective of a culture that so values the idea of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and yeah. and like and this kind of like competence competency mm -hmm. will lead you somewhere and hard work like do we feel like that story i guess we uh, yeah. i guess i guess i'm pointing yeah. this yeah. at you as a, as, <laughs> do we as think a culture the story might take a different take a different approach towards mm. those characters do i think that it's true that as a culture you you value those things Oh no, we know that we can, we value those things. Yeah. I'm asking if the story might no, be different. No, I, I just mean that. But right. you also romanticize uh, actual monarchies, like there, there's That's a lot of uh, fetishization and romanticization of the British monarchy. That is absolutely true. No, and right. you know, my, I live in a monarchy. Right. And it's shit. Like <laughs> 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 I mean, right. We are lucky that he's not a particularly awful king, like, right. but nobody chose him, and obviously he has no power now nowadays. It's like right. the British right. monarchy, but it's it's still not a good thing. Like, and I don't know. Like, I, I think that it would it would definitely be different if it was That's written, true. especially like by a Brit by, by a British person, because most British people are monarchists, not like in my country. <laughs> Um, yeah, that is interesting. Like, I, it's funny. It's funny. I think actually, you and I on Twitter had a conversation about yeah, pronunci so. pronunciation and yeah. this being an American story. But it's true. I mean, I've never really analyzed the story in terms of like, and I have done this with others, like how it relates specifically mm -hmm. to American um, cultural biases and mm -hmm. and you know. Well, you, you ask how it would be different. I mean, it might not even be. Not different. It might just not be the same story. They might not write a no, story about, course. you know, like kings and queens. I mean, so much of the, of the, the story is effectively around the Iron Throne. Right. And no, who it's, will? It's, also right? it's an impossible thing. Oh, it, it is. Suddenly struck me as yeah. an interesting yeah. question, but it's an impossible. I think it's an that impossible thing to I think there will be differences, but honestly, like it's a human story. Like it is. Yeah, that's right. true. Right. Yep. And I think that yep. um, in uh, that's, this is like a. I'm not criticizing. Every American or anything, but <laughs> like I noticed a lot. Like um, sometimes I hear things that like, yeah, we Americans are something or other, like be it positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And 
they're describing something that is only honestly human. Right. It has no, no, very little to do with, right. with actually just specifically Americans. So I think that, you know, like, th th there, are, there are fantasy stories about power and, and kings and everything in every country. Like yeah. Sure. I mean, I do mm -hmm. feel like that this story, more so than many stories, does focus, even though, like, I, I don't think, are, are any of the, like, I guess what you would consider, like, the first tier of characters are old noble. Mm -hmm. Even so, I feel like this story, more so <coughs> than a lot of fantasy stories that, that do kind of have a structure that has to do with, like, the history of royal families and yeah. such, I feel like this story does actually give more time and attention to people who are not highborn than a lot of those stories. I think it really does a good job of that. I mean, we, we did just say that they don't, like, they don't have their own storylines necessarily, mm -hmm. but their perspectives and the things that they mm -hmm. say to the highborn and the ways that they, the, the, the ways that the plot of the story could not really happen without them, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. is, is, is a, an interesting choice that George Martin made. I think by consequence of the medium, the TV show is actually allowed to show that more. And yeah. showcase that a lot more right. because like in the book if you want to talk perspective I right. think Davos they're is not, just you know as you're saying right. they're not the Davos is the first time you really get to right. think about his rise and what it's like to yeah. live in a world of lords yeah. and nobles yeah. um, but the show at least I think you just are able to see more into an even tiered perspective of uh, a noble speaking with. They also just comment. cast really good people I mean yeah. I think part also of this that. is just the process of making television is they, they, they like they understood the like blessings that they had in the <laughs> castings of those characters. Yeah. I think this applies to most mm. adaptation decisions, but mm. I think that mm, like the show gets more into the characters of the small folk, like Davos, yeah. Missandei, Grey Worm, but the, the books definitely get more into like you know w when Brienne is going through the riverlands, and we get to see the the, like the, the consequences yeah, of the, the whole consequences right. of war with yeah. with very small characters who are there for one scene, and that's the kind of thing that we never get in the in the show. Right, mm -hmm. right and we yeah. it's it's impossible. Like yeah. Well, one of the one of the threads in the books that I really did love was um, the Inn at the Crossroads, which first it's owned by Masha Heddle, and then Catelyn arrests Tyrion there, and so Masha is put to death by the Lannisters yeah. just because mm -hmm. she was there. Mm -hmm. And then I think her like nephew takes it over, and then he's put to death by a different roving band of bandits, and then it's taken over by her nieces who turn it into like an orphan's home. And that's great because it's one of those things that you only notice if if you if you pay attention because no no one tells you this but uh, yeah. each time that an, a new character goes through the inn of the crossroads someone different is yep. is in charge of it yeah yep. <laughs> but and and that is a choice though to, to not tell that point of view yeah, for sure. mm -hmm. and in the show i think you're right what you were saying that yeah. um, we get more um, even just with like Roz's journey right uh, yeah and you know the, the famous broken man speech which they yeah. teased us with it in the in the show by giving it the episode title yeah. that we never got the actual speech but ah, okay crying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you got quite a bit of it I don't know if it's the same in or, or not but uh, in A Storm of Swords when Jamie and Arya start some sort of like circling each other yes. around and in and they yeah. keep coming back to this husband and wife and they're like oh you just missed them they took the boat and they're, 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 <laughs> yep. and they're just like ah you people in your war and it's all like it, it's yep. very like far removed from them they're just like I don't know I just as long as I have bread on my table I'm okay yeah. right <laughs> well and it's ultimately <laughs> That That's is the what concern. Right. That is the exactly the concern. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, right. Okay. Let me let me go to this question. So, so we have a bunch of common people who I think I my question I said found themselves in this place. They absolutely positioned themselves in this place for the most part <laughs> of being near lords and and so n both narratively and in the s in the world they they kind of s are straddling different aspects of the world and. Uh, I was curious how you all, like if you had examples or or things about that, like in relation to how they see like the true small folk. Like I know, like I feel like they're, they're kind of an in, they're in ended up being in between characters because, because they are, I think some of them even talk about it on the show, like that they are no longer, you know, they do have food and they do have like fancy yep. clothes and they yeah. do have influence, a Davos, lot of influence. Mm -hmm. Davos and Gendry talk, uh, right, talk about that. That's what I was thinking about. When, that great when Gendry's in prison, like, right. like the Gendry doesn't believe that the, the other guy is, uh, is exactly. yeah, you know, one of one of the yeah, three bottom legit, guys. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, how do you see like they, how they kind of speak for or look at like the actual masses in the story? 
Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I would just like to talk a little bit about Vera, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, this, yeah. Was my, this was my question, so that I could talk about Vera's. Var Varys's <laughs> rise is really right. Varys's rise is really interesting. I also really loved um, what the show, and I think, yeah, the book too. Sorry, you'll have to excuse me. I read the books multiple times, but also not for many years. So when I talk about stuff, I'm mostly talking about the show these days. Um, but I have these three. So <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I knew I, I'm off the hook. We're just here to encyclopedia right. for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's really interesting because what I what I particularly love about Varys in relation to this question is that you do come into the story assuming that he and Littlefinger are like kind of the same. I mean, very different mm. in many ways, but like doing yeah. the same thing. And then you especially and then in the show because in the books right. th they're not put against each other. Like right. Okay. So this is yeah. definitely a show thing. Okay. So I'm speaking about the show. Let me just. <laughs> now say that officially. <laughs> um, the I find it really interesting, kind of emotionally, that you go through this process that you distrust both of them equally um, and, you know, maybe hate, maybe enjoy enjoy hating, whatever, you know, whatever relationship you have to these kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and then little by little, you know, throughout the many seasons, you actually start to believe Varys when, you know, he says, I'm, you know, I'm speaking for the realm. And you, go, mm -hmm. you don't really know what that means, and it also might be a load of bullshit, but by the end, you start to actually believe him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I find that really, really interesting, especially because he's a foreigner who somehow has decided to speak for this realm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he is someone who I went through the emotional process um, in a very satisfying way of, like, because everyone seems so selfish, um, it turns out that this one dude actually probably isn't. Which is kind of amazing. It's nice, <laughs> and um, and and it is nice that he actually has somehow gone through all of this and mm -hmm. sacrificed all this stuff and been through all this shit, and like certainly could have been, you know, corrupted by his role and his many years yeah. um, of of being on the small council. He could have become that other person, mm -hmm. and yet he somehow didn't, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I've been a fan of Barry since like. Uh, the scene in the in the black cells with Ned, mm. and I believed him. Like right. I, I know that some people didn't. I did not in the beginning, especially <laughs> in the books because the books, and I, I'm not really very comfortable with it that the books called him do that thing that you know some that Disney does with some villains that you know they called him in a in a feminine way to mm -hmm. imply that he's evil, right. and I, 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 I that's a bit messy. The the, 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 the show I think doesn't do that as much at least. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, I, I just believe him from the start. Like not not in the show, in the books. Like in the he's much more cool, I think. I, I think he's more ambiguous, and also in the books, I I do think his end game might be a little different. Like yeah, for sure. Aegon sure, plot sure. and everything, yeah. but sure, sure. definitely in the show, he's he's uh, a man of his word. I mean, yeah. yeah he's well, to think for for the, right. the show, uh, I mean, to think think in terms of the show, I think yes, he always says you know he's doing things for the realm and. I, the reason I do believe him is actually, I would say, the principal um, uh, point of our um, panel, which is the common people. I mean, the king and Tyrion and whoever wants to make a proclamation can say that they're doing it for the good of the realm, for the good of the people. But Varys has his past to contend with and <laughs> what it was like to, I think he was a beggar on the street at one point, right? Um, this is after, I believe, he was the eunuch or maybe before. I, I don't remember the exact order, but... He was never a powerful but dude. Yeah, he was never powerful, and he saw the actual effect of governance on the people, whether in Essos or Westeros or wherever. And so I think when he says it, it is actually more authentic and means more. Yeah, I think that Varys has the, the only actual answer to Littlefinger's question about what is the realm. Yes. Like, sure. uh, Littlefinger meant that in a, in a very nihilistic way, but Varys actually has an answer. Like, the realm is the people. Right. And Varys yeah. is absolutely yeah. not a nihilist. No, no, no I think not at all. No I matter think he believes in the good. Yeah. Of the realm. Well, and yeah. what's interesting to me, what's most interesting to me in his case is that in a, in a story that has a lot to say about honor, mm -hmm. um, he's not actually, like, by the standards of the, of, the, like, of the philosophy of the show, he's not actually an honorable person, but below that, right, because he doesn't follow the rules, like, he is absolutely going to s change sides and do whatever, but below all of that, his actual goals are possibly the most honorable. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that that is completely, like we it gets him killed. all said. Is like it gets him killed in the end. It <laughs> does, right, right, and c but is completely tied to the fact that he wants to do good. And so mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. a, re it's just, it's, it's a really fascinating 
kind of mix of so many things that are going on in the show at large. He's uh, like a microcosm mm -hmm. of all of that. Like, what is honor if it's not for good? What mm -hmm. what is what is keeping your oaths if those oaths will lead to destruction for other people? Yeah. It just it really it it has embedded in his story all of these questions of like all these things that we assume to be true, especially in in the realm of a fantasy story, all these things yeah. that we assume to be true may not actually be true, and that this guy who, you know, is a turncloak, is a, like a, a million <laughs> things, like all mm -hmm. the bad things that like someone like Ned would say about a person. Yeah, I think that right. reminds me like of his scene with Ned weird, in yeah. the right? Black exactly. like It's and weirdly Ned-like, too. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but for <laughs> Ned, for Ned, like, Ned didn't seem to respect Varys because for his own, for mm. his very classic c right. code of honor, mm -hmm. Varys yeah. was a coward. Yes. Oh yes. But yes. he said, w w "How would I have defended you? With mm -hmm. what weapons? And do right. I, am I a fighter? I'm not a fighter. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I serve the yeah. people better yeah. if I stay alive yeah. to actually be the one person exactly. who thinks about them. Yeah. 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 Now, I mean. I don't want to rain on the Varys parade too much. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I'm actually, I'm not that person. You can, you can say all sorts of things about oh my boy. one of my favorite characters, and I will just. Well, no, I do think it's interesting coming back to the the split between books and show because in the books it's made more explicit that like his little birds, his network, mm -hmm. his information network, like he he has their tongues cut out, um, like before they get shipped to him, because uh, there's a point in book one where he's meeting with Illyrio in the black cells and or in the crypts or whatever. And he says, oh, I, plus I need a, another 50 birds. And Illyria's like, oh, it's so hard to find kids and rip their tongues out. Like, do we have to keep doing this? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I need some more birds. Um, and okay, so, but I, I totally I forgot. And clearly it's, or blocked it's out that. It's far down there. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's repressed. But I, I different characters. Yeah, different characters. But I, it is kind of, I don't know, I, to almost come back to that Gendry thing, the way he, he still does have to rely on, like, these... Um, like like violence of a form to push himself up and up to a place where he can make things better. Because um, I think that's one really interesting thing about uh, sort of lowborn characters who rise up is is how many of them have to like give up their their souls, their their morality, what they consider to be good things in order to get the power, in order to change things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Littlefinger's probably the evil version of <laughs> an even even eviler version of that in that he just has no morals whatsoever. Right. Um, but yeah, Varys is willing to do some nasty stuff to get the power to change things. Um, which I think, I don't know, that's, it's an indictment of like the system, but um, yeah, it's, it's too bad. <laughs> uh, right, but I, I, I'm always interested in when, when, um, when characters, and I think a lot of these do, aren't just necessarily an indictment of the system, but, but suck us in, and so they end up being a, pla a point at which we have to question our own place in the system. Totally. Even if we're not just doing that intellectually, we can do that emotionally mm -hmm. and not ever mm -hmm. like actually say those words, but like that's fascinating when you have a character that actually like takes you there emotionally. Yeah. And I feel like they do that in a really interesting way that I don't think the highborn characters can really do because of the place that they sit. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not in the there's structure. There's, about you. there's a character in season eight that does that, but not uh, on purpose. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah. I wanted to mention Bron mm -hmm. because, oh, yes. yeah, yes. and you know, he's not a good person, and he's using just his abilities to kill people uh, for for high lords, you know. Right. So, like, I like the character a lot, uh, not as a person, you know, right. <laughs> as a character. Yeah, as a character. <laughs> and I I remember that a lot of people were pissed off uh, by the end of season eight when he became not only master of coin but uh, lord of high garden. And I get that, but uh, I mean, it's not a good idea. Like, I, I agree. Right. But it's so much of what they do is not a good <laughs> <Of> idea. <course. laughs> but I do believe that it's a realistic idea, a, a realistic. In uh, in yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that he prepares, uh, prepares us for that earlier in the season when I think, uh, was it Jamie that said, like, we can't have a, a cutthroat as the Lord of High Garden? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he ma makes the point that how, how did you arrive at your castle? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that's totally true. Like, mm -hmm. uh, there's no legitimate king. There's no... No, that's true. Like, no, yeah. yeah th sure. we, I like Daenerys, and even if she didn't go a bit, you know, too far. <laughs> <laughs> but so her, her claim is... Yeah, yes, you know. <laughs> if she had born, like, one or two fewer people. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> that panel's later. <laughs> No, uh, I, I lost my train of thought. No, no, but he, he yeah, questions yeah. the whole idea of yeah. legitimacy, yeah. which right. is a, right. it's a very 
Sorry, I was about to say legitimate again, and that's really bad English. But, <laughs> but it's 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 a tr it's a true question to ask about all of these people. I think it, it's a, quest, a good question that a bad character raises, if, if you right. know what I mean. Absolutely, like, yeah. like he's doing it n not in order to change the system, but to be part of the system. Yeah. He, he he's he's not criticizing them for being Castros. He says, "Yeah, I'm a Castro too, so I want to." To, to right. be a, like a lord I'm like you. I'm part of your yeah. club. Yeah. Yeah. You, just, you just haven't let me in yet. Exactly. What, what I would say is, <laughs> well, yeah. well, I, I keep saying irony, but what's almost ironic about that is for all the talk of Daenerys wanting to break the wheel, he, he in many ways is, is breaking the established wheel. He's, he's, a, a <laughs> he's a murderer for hire. He's in everything. You know, he's, he's being paid to be a friend to you. Right. So he will do what you ask if you pay him money, and he is now the Lord of Highgarden. Right. So that, that is a broken wheel if ever I saw one. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will actually disagree, because I think that his point is that, that it's the same thing. Right. Is that he that, that wants to, yeah. he wants to spin wheel. the wheel a few yeah, more the, times. The, the, but the, the old houses, the especially the great houses, love to like, big like, money, you know, like pretend that their power comes from something else. Even the, even the houses we like, like House Stark didn't become the, the wardens of the, nov, the, of the North by being nice, by being Ned-like. Right, you get to do Thousands of years ago, they were probably more like the Boltons in, yeah. order, to, to, in order to be able to become this. Right, you, to, yeah. to become a ruler, you have to first be a conqueror in yeah. this world. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I will also add, I really like that the show ended with him on the small council because I think it would have been just uh, infinitely more cheesy if everyone on the small council was like a nice person. Yeah. <laughs> but it makes so much more sense that of right. course like the small council is still flawed. There's still like this asshole who's going to steal and embezzle and of course. you know probably kill someone else on the small council before a decade's out. And right. I, I, I don't know if it's, a, if, if it's a good idea or a bad, a bad idea, but it's certainly interesting that the master of coin is also the lord of the richest uh, right. uh, <laughs> land. Uh, yeah. That may ca cause problems, or maybe, I don't know. I don't or know. Ma maybe it might be exactly the synergy they need. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I mean, he, he won't, like, at least he won't steal from himself, right. I guess. Well, and I, no, I think, I think, you know, it would be unrealistic to have watched, you know, someday maybe we'll get to read all the books or watched all these seasons of television and think that <laughs> somehow we were going to end up with a small council that was, like, going to function well. <laughs> like, I just don't think that's what the story was telling us we were ever going to go to. I was actually hoping for for like a, a, a larger, like a large council, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right. Mm. Like right. instead of a, a parliament. Well, a parliament, a, a, yeah. a proto parliament, <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, should we open it to questions? Yeah, I think so. Uh, who would have questions? Uh, yeah. Oh, great. We didn't even mention him. I think. No, we didn't. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of characters that we could talk about. That, that's topic. like popular. I mean, they didn't really explore it that much, but I think it's populism at its finest. I mean, he <laughs> he he was he. Uh, what is it? We uh, you are the few, and we are the many. Yeah, like that. That in and of itself it's is, is I, I never speaking on what he is convincing the common people what they think. Mm -hmm. but I never bought it because um, you know, in feudalism, you have like. Uh, uh, st how do you say in, uh, in English? I, I don't know. But I instead of classes, you have like states or is, is castes. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, yeah, like he isn't. He isn't. Uh, he isn't part of the small folk. He's he's the pope. Right. You know what I mean? Like he's right. he's hijacking the small folk in mm -hmm. order to in order to blackmail the nobles. I, yep. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, is that even if in, yeah. even I if think he he's self-made though, and, and also that. Well, but the, the the faith itself, more so in the show than in the books, but the faith itself is like uh, deeply. Yeah. Oh yeah. But that the faith itself is like you know uh, oppressive and yeah. and uh, just really regressive ideas of what's okay for society and going around smashing jugs of wine like that. Um, his use of power isn't to reform the system, but again, to just sort of replace it with a sure. different form of... It's his version of control. Yeah. Right. But the reason yeah. I say that it's effective so you just, is... You just turned him also into a brawn. <laughs> yeah, he's... He, I'm well, saying the Pope is brawn. <laughs> no, wait. I, I've wait. always... No, you're saying the High Sparrow is brawn. We don't we need to take it into our world. I, I think that perception is reality. That's like, for me as like a psych major, that that's always been like a guiding principle. I think, you know, your your perception is your reality, and that makes it reality because that is what you live in and so if he can convince people as they showed very quickly <laughs> in season five that they are oppressed and here's why and here's how i'll fix it that that's true and then suddenly cut to the end of the season you have thousands of people throwing things at cersei in the street yeah so it 
I think it worked. Right. Well, and also it shows that, you know, he has gone through changes himself and mm -hmm. that those kinds of changes within an individual puts them in a place where they can they can have more empathy. Yeah, I uh, I love the Brotherhood, particularly the, the the one line that really like s captures the core of of them and their mission for me is that any knight can make a knight, right? When they're going around knighting people, that's like the most <laughs> subversive thing in the series because it's it's um it is originally people with you know social power. It's Beric Dondarrion who yeah. you know is this handsome dude with lots of money, very um, handsome. Very handsome. And um, such a good voice. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, man. <laughs> yeah. If we could get a Richard Dormer on the panel. Um, but then the, the way that they like enter into the network of small folk in the Riverlands and it becomes really like the only example we have of like <laughs> organized common folk in Westeros. Yeah. Um, Doing like community defense work, yeah. like you, know, you have all these people warning each other about the Lannisters are coming and like taking shelter in the trees, and these weird guys like the Mad Huntsman with his pack of hounds, and all these kind of quirky uh, small folk figures, and using that mission of any knight can be a knight or any knight can make a knight rather um, to like continue on the the purpose of a real knight of a true knight which is to defend the innocent and see that and that's interesting the because it it's almost like all you need is for one noble person to turn one yep. if you get one knight to turn and like face towards the small mm -hmm. folk then then you're good yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying love <laughs> it I, I would argue the point about the knight's watch because though it's technically technically true that they should be treated equally they're not right. because yeah, yeah and Maybe you could argue that you know John, for example, was more prepared, so of course they're going to be uh, giving him a higher role, but he's more prepared because he was a noble. Well, well so yeah, it's an organization that replicates the same power structure in the rest of Westeros society. Yeah. So of course, if you're in a powerful place yeah. in the rest of and Westeros society, exactly. you're gonna and historically th that happens with military too, with the military. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true. I mean that's true too, just for Mormont, for Jared Mormont, just being yeah. the commander, oh just yeah. the person who already had power ahead of time coming in. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think too, like, speaking as a Reddit moderator. <laughs> um, yeah, really, you, you are the person. <laughs> I mean, like. Thank you for your service. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, Reddit tends to skew male. I don't know if you've noticed. And yes. um, ten, I mean, like, tends to skew uh, people who look exactly like me, basically. Um, and I think that there are a lot of, like, really powerful men in the story, and that for a lot of fans, who are men, like, it, y you find a powerful male, and you're like, 
that's awesome. Wh- uh, George R. Martin was completely befuddled when Randall Tarley became like a big fan favorite. People were like, "Yeah, Randall the Vandal, like he's he's the coolest." Um, yeah, this was a thing. I, this I have not heard this. I, this was <laughs> I exist in a very different it's world. Like it's a random. But, but have you watched like Breaking Bad? Like there are people yeah. p- for whom Walter exactly. White is a hero. Exactly. So it's it's um, so tread lightly. Yeah, people who have power <laughs> are are really easy to want to be and to like want to empathize with. I think. Um, so I think it's just harder to for the average person to like. Uh, mm. Jump into the shoes of someone who is powerless, who who you know is is suffering more. I think it's the same reason you know Sansa's highborn, but same reason so many people have trouble empathizing with Sansa. <laughs> she's powerless. For a it's also misogyny, story. like it's not yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. Like I- I- the example you said, like Tywin and Tywin and Shay. Mm-hmm. I think that part of it is the the difference in class, but a large part of it is undoubtedly the gender. They, uh, they both die at the same time, but Tyrion only really thinks about. Well, he thinks about both of them, but the fandom, I think, reflects yeah. on Tywin's death more than Shay's death. Right? Except me. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think it's we a, mi- a, a we mixture remember. of, I guess, writing and/or like representation. Because I, I remember I've, I've loved Sansa from day one. Um, I know a lot of people did not, and I'm talking strictly from the books. I was right. going to like her in the show because of that. Most people didn't, as we know. I don't remember ever having a strong feeling about Tywin in the books, and to be honest. But I do remember absolutely loving him in the show because probably of Charles Dance. Of course, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. That I genuinely think. I don't know that it's like character I, specifically. I defy anyone to I just watch Charles Dance <laughs> skin a deer and not mm. be like, I mm. want to know everything about this person. I, I said well, this yesterday. But I, yeah. Oh, no, I was saying I have a deeper question. Oh. Mm-hmm. I don't like Tyrion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think yes. part of that is that the people who play the characters are Yes. Right. I'm not sure the show ever promised us that that wheel was going to get broken, and I think ultimately the message is that it didn't. I I think that a lot of people focus too much on who was elected and not on the fact that he was elected. I I said it before. Like, I think it is a change that uh, Mm. monarchy will will not be hereditary anymore. I'm sure that there may be a civil war too about it, but (laughs) I mean, still a nobility monarchy. Like. They, they, yeah, they still laugh at the idea that everyone should be able to vote. It's right, a select right. few, and they would. but it's but a start. It's like an American start, totally basically. <laughs> someone brought it up. I mean, I, I, I will say too that Tyrion and Bran both seem to be in like service positions instead of like power positions as much. Like, like this is a, an act of service. Their their kingship and handship, as right. opposed to like I'm hand because my dad was hand and now I'm powerful. Right. Um, so I, that's where I see some hope for transformation, but it's definitely gradual. <laughs> you know, it's a, yeah. We're not seeing like, the workers' d- revolution. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> I, I don't know what people expected. Like, like yeah, um, I would have. Yeah, it would have been a terrible show if it ended with like an actual like a uh, Marxist Soviet revolution. Yeah. 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 yeah, You had a re- you had a rebuttal <laughs> to that. I, what's a Ultimately, I guess that's part of the message is they did laugh at the idea of asking you and me. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. I know we that's ultimately part of the st- end of the story is that we, no one in this room was going to be was going to be asked who they wanted to rule. I think we have <laughs> one more question, or is that the yes, end? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. do we have time for one more? One more. We have one okay. more minute. Okay. Okay. I would give anything for the Varys backstory. 
that's a great question. I would like like a Davos the smuggler story. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Honestly, now I'm thinking like a Brotherhood without banners story. Oh, that'd would be, be so amazing. cool. Amazing. Mm. Uh, George has also talked about his idea for like a, a spin-off prequel was uh, like spear carriers, like soldiers who are in a common armory, or the POV POV of someone who's in Shatai's brothel in King's Landing. I mean, I think yeah, an investigation cool of like all the yeah. pockets that are really interesting, but that mm-hmm. that we. That weren't spotlight spotlit by the uh, story. Yeah. I would say anyone but Daria. Yeah. Anyone, <laughs> just like anyone, anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> just don't care. <laughs> Fighting words. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much, everyone. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the con. Thanks. Can I just say, podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support. Pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash common room radio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag can I just say and follow us on Twitter at just say podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening.